world's most successful moneymaker. Warren Buffett has more money than the gross domestic products of more than half the world's countries. On the latest count, he has $40 billion. I think you guys are earning your money. <laughs> and he made it all by simply investing in the right companies. Some people are better at certain things than others, you know. There's a lot of people who sing a lot better than I can. <laughs> I'm better at making money than most people. If you'd trusted him to look after $10,000 for you when he started out, you'd have a cool $50 million now. This was one hell of a wallop of money. Everyone who's anyone wants to be seen with him. Hi. But Buffett himself remains charmingly down to earth. <laughs> the world's super rich have often found themselves reviled of late. And Mr. Buffett has his doubts about them too. The idea that the people that move money around are some favored class strikes me as getting pretty far away from <laughs> where we should be. Buffett is different. He's built a huge business empire and has developed his own special way of running it. He's a unique leader. I can't think of anyone close. What you see is what you get. Absolutely, 100%. Warren Buffett has given me a rare chance to explore his world. I want to find out how he makes his money and whether he is the acceptable face of the filthy rich. I've arrived in Omaha, in the Midwestern state of Nebraska, a city 1,200 miles from Wall Street that grew up as a center for the railroad and meatpacking industries. Today, it's home to less than half a million people. My destination is this nondescript block. Warren Buffett has agreed to see me and I've already started picking up some clues about him. Well, I've got a meeting with Mr. Buffett in his own headquarters here, up on the 14th floor of this building. And if you want a measure of the kind of guy he is, you should hear this email he sent us. He can't give us very long, he explains, because from an actuarial standpoint, I only have about 4,000 days left on this earth, and I'm trying to keep various activities in proper proportion. It's a perfectly rational calculation, but not one that most people would perform, I think. Mr. Buffett runs a company called Berkshire Hathaway. It's worth $150 billion. Yet it rents just one floor of offices. Mr. Buffett isn't one for extravagance. So this is the recreation. This is it. This is it. This is our wine cellar. But, uh, feel free to have a Coke. Thank you very much. Berkshire Hathaway invests in other companies that employ thousands of people. <laughs> Buffett personally owns a quarter of the enterprise. So it really is, literally, this is the office, is it? I mean, it doesn't seem very big somehow. Well, we have a full floor. Uh, I've been here 47 years. Moved in on January 1st of uh, 1962. And uh, uh, gradually we've built it up to where we now have 20 employees here. We have about 240,000 around the world. And, and uh, this is world headquarters, uh, despite the fact of, it doesn't look like it. <laughs> This is Buffett's team. Yes, the whole team running the $150 billion empire. I've seen smaller companies who have more staff to look after the coffee. He has a couple of secretaries, and he has some accounting people and a bond trader, and not much more than that. 
I've never seen anything like it. And in my experience of looking at dozens of businesses, he has almost no support or help. Buffett has a personal assistant who fends off endless inquiries. Mr. Buffett's office. And according to him, he just sits in his office reading all day. One moment, please. Now there's no there's no computer on your desk. I've never had a computer in there. I've never had a calculator in there, and uh, and I've never had a stock ticker in there. From here, Buffett makes investments and buys companies, working his financial magic. Once a year, Omaha awakes. There's an invasion of Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. Thirty-five thousand of them make the pilgrimage to Buffett's annual general meeting. Woodstock for capitalists, it's often called. Good morning, everyone. The meeting is being held in the arena at the far end of the hall. Anyone can buy Berkshire shares and buy themselves a slice of Buffett's success. Talk about popular capitalism, eh? It's not your usual company meeting. Along with this massive gathering, there are special events at local businesses, owned by Berkshire Hathaway. This ice cream parlor enjoys its busiest night of the year, and here I find out these people are not just shareholders; they're disciples. He has common sense. How many people in this world have common sense right now? I'm a college student, and even I have this perspective of him as like a can do no wrong type person. He is as he appears. He's a regular guy. Well, he's the greatest investor of all time. Along with ice cream, you can buy books about the man they call the Oracle of Omaha. And try to glean the secret of his success. At the shareholder meeting, Buffett is surrounded by crowds and cameras. I feel, I feel a little lonely. I mean, it. <laughs> the life you'd expect for a celebrity billionaire. But away from the spotlight, unlike many of the other super rich, he lives in a very different world. <laughs> the real world. Take his house. He bought it for thirty-one thousand dollars more than fifty years ago. It sits on the corner of a pleasant enough residential neighborhood in Omaha. Well, I'm happy there. I mean, I'd move if I thought I'd be happier someplace else. How would I improve my life by having ten houses around the globe? I mean, if I'd wanted to become, you know, a superintendent of housing or something of the sort, you know, I could have gone into that as a profession. But I do not want to manage ten houses, and I really don't even want somebody else doing it for me. And I don't know why the hell I'd be happier. Not even the biggest house in the street. Uh, I'm I'm warm in the winter. I'm cool in the summer, and it's it's convenient for me. I can't imagine having a better house. <laughs> It's the same story with his car. Now, I think in about the year that he was declared the richest man in the world, and wanted you to go and buy a car for him. Is it true that you procured a car cheaply because it had hail, hail damage. damage? Yes. Yeah, I've bought his last, I think his last three or four cars. And you have to understand, he keeps cars until I tell him this is getting embarrassing. Time for a new car. Now they they don't look hail damaged because they fix them, but because they've been hail damaged, they're cheaper. So you know, <laughs> what better deal can you get? Buffett does have some super rich friends. Closest of all to him is Bill Gates. This year, Gates is the richest person in the world. Last year it was Buffett, but they've both been at the top of the rich list for years. It's not a touchy subject, apparently. Oh, we definitely joke about it. You know, I, depending on his position, I'll usually try to send him something humorous. Uh, 
it relates to that. I remember he was all the way down at eight one time. I sent him a lucky eight ball. Gates was introduced to Buffett, a man 25 years older than him with no interest in computers. But their friendship quickly developed out of a shared passion for business and bridge. Sharon Osberg often plays and travels with them. It is like a father-son, and I think Bill will tell you that too, like a father-son relationship. Bill is very interested in learning from Warren. And they're clearly on the same, you know, on the same intellectual plane. So when they get going, those brains get firing. It's really quite something. They both have simple tastes and a love of junk food. Warren has never ramped up his ability to consume. You know, as long as a cheeseburger doesn't get too expensive and, you know, the price of Coke is uh, less than a, than a couple bucks, Warren's going to be fine. Now, when you have some time with Warren Buffett, what do you do? Well, you try to work out how he does it. Buffett really is different. While the guys on Wall Street like to make a quick buck, Buffett prefers to take it more slowly. To invest. <laughs> and that's the first lesson in the Buffett primer. Invest. Don't speculate. Well, let's talk about making money. Is there a meaningful distinction to be drawn between making money out of investment and making money out of speculation? Well, it's always a bet, isn't it? It's always a gam gamble. No, it isn't a gamble. It, it, there is a real distinction. Uh, basically, it, 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 it's subjective. But an investment attitude, you look to the asset itself to produce the return. So if I buy a farm and I expect it to produce $80 an acre for me in terms of its revenue from corn and soybeans and it cost me $600. I'm looking, at the, I'm looking at the return from the farm itself. I'm not looking at the price of the farm every day or every week or every year. On the other hand, if I buy a stock and I hope it goes up next week, to me, that's pure speculation. Other investors look at prices every minute, hoping they'll go up. But all that effort, and not one, is as rich as Buffett. To help him invest, Warren has a right-hand man. He's not like the Wall Street guys either. He's 85 years old, for one thing. Charlie Munger. I asked him to give me some details, important details, as to what they like to invest in. As it happens, they have a checklist, and Charlie spelt it out for me, item by item. We have to deal in things that we're capable of understanding, and then once we're over that filter, we have to have a business with some intrinsic characteristics that give it a durable competitive advantage. And then, of course, we would vastly prefer a management in place with a lot of integrity and talent. And finally, no matter how wonderful it is, it's not worth an infinite price. So we have to have a price that makes sense that's a very simple set of ideas. Simple indeed. With this checklist, Munger and Buffett have found some great investment opportunities. Hidden gems? Overlooked by the clever investors on Wall Street? I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with Well, hardly hidden. Take Coca-Cola. Great marketing over the decades had made it the world's best-known brand. I like to teach the a good product, a good team. In the 80s, it ticked all Buffett's boxes. What really counts is how the Coca-Cola company does. And that really is not a bet. It's an analysis of the fundamental earning power of the asset and looking to, the, to that earning power to justify the price you pay. On that basis, Coke shares seemed excellent value by a comfortable margin. So Buffett and Munger spent a billion dollars buying them. For many, many months, we were buying as much Coca-Cola as we could buy, roughly a third of the volume trading, every day for months. We were very aggressive in buying into Coca-Cola. Within four years, their investment had quadrupled in value, but they didn't sell. And today, they still own Coke shares worth $10 billion. The 
they invested in other big brands too, like American Express and Walt Disney. And unlike most investors, when they bought, they really went for it. They put a third of their assets into Coca-Cola. It's not recommended for ordinary savers, but would-be Warren Buffett should remember, you don't have to diversify. You break one of the cardinal rules of investment, diversification. I mean, everybody's told, don't put all your eggs in one basket, spread them as widely as possible. You actually do sometimes and put enormous numbers of eggs yeah. in one basket, don't you? I stick with what I know. If somebody owns 50 stocks, can they really like the one they rank as number 50 as well as the, the one they rank as number one? Can they know it as well? I don't think so. <laughs> However Buffett does it, it works. He's grown his investment fund by 20% a year. 20% in one year is good, but as an average, over decades, it's unheard of. And it snowballs. A thousand dollars put into Berkshire shares in 1965 is now worth over five million dollars. <laughs> Meet Dick Holland. He's living proof of the Buffett formula. He trusted Buffett with his money in the early 60s. And Warren has made him rich. Very rich. What I have today, you know, is beyond my wildest dreams. I, I expected, you know, to be, do decently and uh, enjoy life and all that kind of thing. But uh, this was one hell of a wallop of money. Holland is so rich that he's been able to give away tens of millions. In recognition, Omaha's huge new art center is named after him and his wife. Well, I tried to thank Warren once. I said, you know, said, really thank you for making me rich, you know. And he said, oh, I didn't make you rich. You didn't sell. We spoke to Dick Holland, and he's incredibly grateful. I mean, it's... it's it must be very nice to have people who are that great. But he says you sort of don't accept the, uh, the thanks that he would like to give you. Well, I, no, I, I know he's grateful, but I'm grateful to him. I mean, he went with me when I was a 26 or 27-year-old kid that looked about 20 <laughs> and behaved like he was 15. I mean, so he bet on me at a time when a lot of people wouldn't have bet on me. So I'm grateful to him. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's mutual. Buffett's down-to-earth approach is beguiling, but can making so much money really be as simple as he makes it sound. It's simple, but it is not easy. He has spent nearly 80 years building up a mental file of everything that he knows about companies and businesses. He works at it all the time, and he doesn't really like to admit that. So how did a middle-class boy from the Midwest turn himself into the richest man in the world? Buffett was born in Omaha, only a few miles from where he meets his shareholders today. His father was a stockbroker, which was tough in the Depression years. Later, Howard Buffett was elected to Congress, and the family moved to Washington, where young Warren discovered money-making. He had several paper routes, and he had a used golf ball business, he had a chain of pinball machines for a while in a barber shop. I mean, I probably left things out, but he was always doing these sorts of things. Buffett had a newspaper round in this rich apartment block. He built it up until, with his other businesses, he was earning more money than his teachers. But the young Warren had his adolescent troubles. I had all these friends in Omaha and everything was going wonderfully, and then all of a sudden we ended up in Washington, D.C. So I behaved very badly. Buffett got into the wrong crowd and stole golf balls and even clubs from a department store on this site. I didn't need the things that, uh, that I was shoplifting uh, when I was 12 or 13, but I, I was just doing it out of the show I was unhappy with the world for a while. At heart, Buffett was a law-abiding citizen. 
From the age of 13, he completed his own tax return. He was already thinking big. I remember one time when he was about, oh, maybe 16 or 17, and he said to me, I'm going to be a millionaire by the time I'm 30. I think it was 30. But he told me this, and I, I thought, yeah, he probably will be, but I didn't think anything of it, kind of, you know, because that's just who he was. When he left school, Buffett headed for New York, not to Wall Street, but to study. His tutor was Ben Graham, author of a best-selling book, The Intelligent Investor. He's been Buffett's guru ever since, not least for introducing him to someone called Mr. Market. Well, Mr. Market is in Chapter 8 of The Intelligent Investor, probably the most important thing I've ever read in my life. Very simple concept. It, it says the market is there to serve you and not to instruct you. Imagine Mr. Market is the man you do business with. You can buy or sell from him any day of the year. But he has unpredictable moods. Sometimes his prices are too high or too low. And that gives you a chance to make money. So in the stock market, you get this wonderful opportunity to deal with this crazy, psychotic a uh, partner called Mr. Market, and he does it with thousands of companies. See? And every day he gives you that offer, and when he's wrong, you take advantage of him. But you don't start paying attention to what he's saying to tell you whether you're right or wrong. You pay attention to him because he is there to serve you and not to instruct you. In his 20s, Buffett left New York and moved back to Omaha. He learned the ukulele to impress the father of the girl he wanted to marry. It worked with the dad and then with his daughter, the gregarious Susie Thompson, who became Mrs. Buffett. Soon there were three children. They never became the spoiled children of the super rich. When I was a teenager and I'd say, gee, could I have five dollars to go get my dinner at McDonald's, he'd say, yeah, but bring back the change. And he'd laugh when he said it, he, but he meant it, too. My dad bought a slot machine, and he put it up on the third floor, and everybody in the neighborhood thought this was the coolest thing ever. So for a while, what happened is we'd get our allowance and we'd stick it in the slot machine, which my dad was not stupid. Um, you know, he got all the money back all the time. Did he give it back to you? Did, you? did he unlock it and let you...? Nope. I think there was a lesson there. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Buffett was making that first million. But this was early in his career, and he was still finding his way. So it wasn't the Coca-Colas he was after. He'd looked to invest in obscure companies using Moody's Manual. Moody's was a directory of financial data of thousands of companies, the kind of thing you can get with a click of a mouse these days. And the young Mr. Buffett would scrutinise it on the search for bargains. He was looking for undervalued companies, the ones when you looked at the total value of the shares, they were somehow worth less than the assets of the company. These were called cigar butts. Why? because you could pick them up for almost nothing, but there was still a little bit of value left inside them. Others were already making money this way. Buffett was happy to as well, until one episode in the early 60s. Warren Buffett was to get a lesson when he went 100 miles from home across the plains of Nebraska to buy a company in the small town of Beatrice. Buffett became the owner of one of the town's biggest employers, Dempster Mill. The company made industrial machinery but it didn't make money. 
So Buffett hired a tough manager, Harry Bottle, to try to turn it round. Dick Tegmeyer worked there and saw how Bottle set about his task. He would walk around the plant and if he saw two people talking outside of either one's office, you could rest assured one of those people would be gone by Friday night. Because they're slacking. And they, they just put fear in a lot of people. But Buffett told his shareholders that Bottle was unquestionably the man of the year. A lot of people have made money doing what Warren Buffett did here. You buy a cheap company that's not performing very well, you take the best bits out of it and sell them off for whatever price you can get. Asset stripping. It has an economic purpose, but it doesn't make you popular with the locals. If I'd come to Beatrice in 1967 and asked people what they thought of Warren Buffett, what would have been the response, do you think? I think it would be quite negative. Um, because this is a close-knit family town and a lot of people got hurt, a lot of people lost their job. And so I think you'd be hard-pressed to see anything positive. A couple of years later, Buffett sold Dempster Mill. He made a decent profit, but he realised he wasn't one for unpopular decisions. You know, why, why get involved in something where the decisions every day are, are, are terrible when you can get into a business where they're very, very easy? It's much more fun to sell Coca-Cola and everybody's smiling. As my partner, Charlie Munger, says, we, we haven't learned how to make a, a, a silk purse out of a sow's ear. We have enough trouble making a silk purse out of silk. <laughs> The conventional wisdom is that Warren Buffett sits in a room buying and selling stocks all day. But the reality is that since the 1960s, he's been buying companies and creating a business that owns dozens of other companies. He's an executive. He's a manager as well as an investor. Exactly. Today, the businesses Berkshire Hathaway owns are worth more than its other investments. And they're a strange mixture. You've got children's toys, you've got metalworking solutions, you've got hard-wearing gloves, clothes, t-shirts, candies. It appears to just be a ragbag collection of different companies. So how does Buffett run so many different businesses? Well, his management secret is that he applies only the lightest hand to the tiller. Renewable bamboo a tankless water heater. Take Clayton Homes, a family business Buffett recently bought for a reported $1.7 billion. How does he interfere? How does he know what you're getting People up to? People don't believe this, but you know, he never came and looked at the company. All we did was talk on the phone and he bought our company. And then all we did, he just said, Kevin, just send me whatever financials you're already producing internally. So we just pass those along quarterly. Um, it, it is too good of a situation to, uh, to believe. Buffett wastes no time on state visits to his businesses, as Bill Gates discovered. One time, only took Warren to visit Microsoft. After we'd spent about a half day doing it, he says, now I've toured Microsoft more than any business that I own. <laughs> because you know, on-site tours <laughs> are not you know, part of how he does his analysis. But if Buffett isn't micromanaging his many companies, what is he doing? Well, that's the next piece of the Buffett formula. He says his job is to allocate capital efficiently. It sounds dull, but it's key to his success. It means taking the profits of one business and investing them in another. You make some money, 
He thinks he can invest it better than you can. He takes it all off you. How's that, manager? Not a, not a problem. If he's got a better use for it, that's fine. Warren Buffett's ability to convince the manager of one of his businesses that, you know what, I can use that capital more efficiently and effectively than you can by putting it in this business over here, which, by the way, you don't run. That is an amazing power of persuasion. Persuasion. That's the next remarkable skill of Mr. Buffett, handling people. My mom says when he was in his 20s, he was reasonably socially inept. I mean, like in, <laughs> right. in, in large crowds, he'd much rather not be there. And, he, you know, he just would rather be reading and working on his stuff. So Buffett learned how to deal with people from self-help guru Dale Carnegie. I was terrified of public speaking when I was in high school and college. I, I couldn't do it. I mean, throw up and everything. So I, I took this Dale Carnegie course, and as soon as I finished it, I was 20 years old. I went out to the University of Omaha, and I said, I want to start teaching, because I wanted to get up in front of people and make sure I didn't lapse back. Carnegie promised anyone could win friends and influence people if they did things like giving people aspirations to live up to instead of nagging them and using their first name all the time. I actually had the diploma in the office and I don't have my diploma from uh, college. I don't have my diploma from graduate school, but I've got my Dale Carnegie diploma there because it changed my life. Today, Buffett uses praise as a business tool. He knows it's not just fat bonuses that motivate people, flattery works too. He described Kevin Clayton as a joy to work with. I think you got a, an honorary mention in the shareholder's letter, is that right, one we, year? We did, thank you. And is it, I mean, is that a sort of a big it's, thing for one of his managers to get? It's the ultimate, yeah. So about 10, right? An owner's dream was how Buffett described Kathy Baron Tamraz to his shareholders. He is a master psychologist. I don't know anyone better. He makes us feel like we can do no wrong and that whatever we do is going to be the right decision. So you're so empowered. And if you think I'm going to let him down after seeing that in the 07 report, forget it. And I think all of the managers, we all feel exactly the same way. Berkshire Hathaway is a massive company which feels like a family firm. All the usual corporate vanities are absent and not a cent is wasted. Take a look at the Berkshire Hathaway website here. To call it low-key would be to put it kindly. It looks as though it's from about 1994. No frills. All the financial data's here, but they haven't even got round to uploading a photo. And that's all very much Warren Buffett's style. Why waste money on a designer? Buffett insists his website does the job. I think it, it's what we are. I mean, it's factual. Oh, it's, it, you could put a, a little picture of something on there, perhaps, or a... I want people to get facts about Berkshire. And, you know, I don't really think it makes any difference what I look like. Side face, Grand Square, God bless America. Land and island, stand beside her. Buffett's idiosyncratic style is not just charming. It's a financial asset. It saves time and money, as it did when he bought the Nebraska Furniture Mart. Started in Omaha by a Russian Jewish emigre, Rose Blumkin. It's run today by her grandson, Bob Bat. She was four foot ten. She was very tenacious, never went to school a day in her life. And, but she knew that she needed to make money and that she was a great salesman. This is a woman that came over from Russia and after 16 years had saved $500 and started a business that became the largest home furnishing store in the United States. And the punchline is she couldn't read or write. I'd always admired her and I went out there on my birthday, August 30th, 1983. She was 89 then and I said, Mrs. B, I'd, you know, I'd like to buy your business. German buyers were also interested but Warren is Warren, and Blumkin preferred to sell to him. The family got together with Mr. Buffett, had a little talk, decided on a figure. The way Warren did it saved on expensive lawyers and consultants. 
I just typed up a little agreement, <laughs> and uh, she made a mark. She, you know, and and uh, uh, we never conducted an audit. I never checked the title to the properties or anything of the sort. We just bought the business. Fifty million dollars changed hands in a flash, and out of it all, the affable Mr. Buffett had secured a good deal. He got that business for less than it was worth. He got it for perhaps a third less than it was worth, and he's done that a number of times. In fact, he has a history of sitting and smiling across the table from people who are talking themselves into selling him things that are worth a lot more than he is paying for it, and he knows that, and they figure it out later. Looking back on it, did you pay a fair price to her? Yeah, there are some people yeah. who say it was a bit low. No, it really wasn't. It, we paid. We bought 80% of it, but we bought it on the basis of paying 60 million for 100%. And that, that was, I regard as a perfectly fair price for a business like that. It was soon after buying the Furniture Mart that Buffett became a billionaire. But this business empire is built on more than his personality. There's a financial rocket fuel behind it, insurance. Insurance companies are at the heart of Berkshire Hathaway. Geico is one of Buffett's favourites. He puts in an appearance in the company video. Along with the chief executive, Tony Nicely. Nicely explains how his staff regard their owner. He is the father figure. The, better yet, he's the grandfather figure. And we all love our fathers, but we have a special place in our heart for the grandfather. Warren is the grandfather of Geico. So what's special about insurance? Will customers have to pay their premiums up front? That creates a massive cash float that Buffett and his partner, Charlie Munger, can take away and invest. For us, who believed we had an edge in terms of investment expertise. Getting into a business that provided float had a special attraction. So we thought we were playing to our strengths. Using insurance float allows Buffett to be different from Wall Street. He can invest in a big way without borrowing money. You see, unlike the clever hedge funds, for example, Buffett doesn't like borrowing, or leverage as it's called. In fact, it's another tenet of the world, according to Warren. Don't get into debt. More smart people have gone broke through leverage than through any other uh, activity. A smart person can't go broke unless they use leverage. I mean, and as one of my friends says, if you're smart, you don't need it. And if you're dumb, you've got no business using it. So it, it just doesn't make sense. Buffett is financially conservative far from the mad crowd that have got our banks into trouble. And he's like that with his children, too. When his daughter was pregnant, she wanted money to build a kitchen extension. What I wanted to do was get a loan. <laughs> it was a loan um, from my dad. I think it was $30,000. Um, and, you know, the answer was no. So we didn't do it. But there are no hard feelings. Today, Susie says her father has been generous. Like her two brothers, she runs a charity that he funds. Her brother, Peter, is a musician. Buffett has always told his children not to expect to inherit his wealth. He doesn't think that would be fair, and they agree. Why in the world, just because my dad's really good at something, has made a lot of money, should I get that? It just doesn't, you know, I mean, it fundamentally uh, doesn't make sense. I could see where other people would think, what a nasty guy and what a crazy kid for not thinking that somehow that should be passed along, but I just, I don't get it. The children did get some shares in Berkshire Hathaway, through an inheritance from their grandfather. If they'd kept them, they would have been wealthy. But Peter sold his 
to fund his music. Yeah, I often say it's like your money or your life. You know, I had this choice, and I would much rather have the career and and the life I've built than sixty million dollars. There's just no question. Now, you're getting a picture of Mr. Buffett, but you want to see some of his glamorous lifestyle, how he flies to the world's best restaurants. Well, he doesn't actually. His favorite is Gorat's of Omaha, the local steakhouse. Are you ready to order? Yes. I'm going to have what Warren Buffett has. Okay. What is that, by the way? A T-bone. Double order of hash browns, three cherry cokes, and a chocolate sundae for dessert. That's what I'll have. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Buffett dines here for nights on end. Forget the fancy foods of the super rich. He keeps it basic. He does not really eat vegetables. He will eat a few. He'll eat tomatoes, but he's uncomfortable with most vegetables. Do we have the orange bars here? In the breakfast. He would have peanuts and Coca-Cola, and that was breakfast. Eat your heart out. I don't think I've ever, and I'm not making this up, in 56 years, seen him drink a glass of water, and I'm pretty sure. I was going to say no fruit, but that's not true. He eats banana cream pie sometimes. And strawberry shortcake. Warren's very good at understanding what works for him, and then he stays with it. I mean, whether he's talking about stocks or talking about food or anything else, he knows what what agrees with it. Hmm. I suppose the thing about Warren Buffett is this: he doesn't go out of his way to be different. He just has a supreme self-confidence. He doesn't judge what he does by the standards of other people. It's true in business and in his personal life, and it means that he's sometimes exceptionally ordinary, but he's also quite happy to be deeply unconventional. Most unconventional have been his relationships. If you know Susie, like I know Susie. After being apparently happily married for more than 20 years, Buffett's wife Susie left Omaha to start a new life in San Francisco. But they didn't get divorced, and this wasn't exactly a marriage breakdown. I said, "I'm not leaving you, because I'll be wherever you want me when you want me. But most of the time, when you're in the same house he is or whatever." He's up reading, and that's why I learned to have my own life. We were two parallel lines. What was unconventional was what happened next. Susie introduced her husband to Astrid Menx, a friend of hers who'd been working as a maitre d in a restaurant in Omaha. When I moved to San Francisco, I called Astrid. I said, "Astrid, will you take one, make him some soup, go over there and look after him." Five months after delivering soup, Astrid Menx moved in with Buffett, with his wife's blessing. She takes great care of him, and he appreciates it, and I appreciate it. She's a wonderful person. Did ever people raise their eyebrows at you at the fact that you had a wife in California? You had a Person you were living with in Nebraska was. I'm sure there were people that raised their eyebrows. They didn't do it in front of me, but it didn't make any difference to me. I mean, the, as long as the three people that were involved were all doing very well and happy with the situation, you know, that was fine with me. But I'm sure that that uh, if you take an poll of all the people in Omaha, I'm sure there was some with raised eyebrows. But that's fine. It it keeps them entertained, and I'm doing fine. <laughs> For 25 years, the triangular relationship continued. Susie Buffett died of cancer five years ago, and Buffett married Astrid, concluding a tale of the most important rule of his life: in marriage, food, or investing, think independently. You have to think for yourself. 
When I look in the mirror in the morning, I say, how do you feel about this? And if the mirror says yes, that's good enough. <laughs> Based well away from Wall Street, he and Charlie Munger have been able to ignore the kind of hype that persuades ordinary investors to jump on bandwagons. We've learned to tune that stuff out. We make our own appraisals, and then when the market has a different appraisal, we back our own instead of the market's appraisal. I think Omaha is helping me understand Buffett's extraordinary success. Here, it's easy to avoid the latest fashion, and it's the unfashionable stocks that are the best deals. And like Omaha, Buffett is unhurried, a tortoise to the Wall Street hare. He accumulates steady returns for decades. While many professional investors earn quick profits, they also make quick losses. In short, Buffett is everything Wall Street isn't. But in the early 90s, Buffett's values were pitted against Wall Street's. Well, Wall Street has been unsettled by a growing crisis at Solomon Brothers, surrounding its illegal trading in US Treasury bonds. Solomon Brothers, one of the biggest investment banks on Wall Street, was in trouble with the financial authorities. Buffett was one of its biggest shareholders. He was persuaded to step in as temporary chairman. The Solomon episode, he would say, is the darkest of his career. And he was dragged into it, and no matter what happened, he was likely to lose part of his reputation and money. The bank had failed to report some illegal trading by its staff. The case was taken on by Jerry Corrigan. Needless to say, I was not a very happy camper. Why wasn't I told about this much earlier? Uh, much, much earlier. And the more I thought about it, uh, frankly, uh, the more angry I became. The US Treasury was preparing to take action that would finish Solomon Brothers off. But on a dramatic Sunday morning, Buffett put his reputation on the line and begged the top Treasury official. I told him that, you know, this was the most important day of my life, and, uh, and I meant it. And I think he felt I was over-dramatizing it, but he also felt that I believed it. And, and, and then he changed an order of the US Treasury on a Sunday, which is not easy to get done. And, and it kept us alive. They were going to shut Solomon down, and in effect, as a personal favor to Warren Buffett, because they considered him honest and trustworthy, they did not do that. I must say that even in a high-tense environment such as this, and believe me, this was high tension. He was always totally level-headed, never loses composure, a gentleman at all times. After the crisis, Buffett started to clean the bank up in a very public way. Mr. Buffett, whose very name stands for integrity, made it clear there had been changes at the top. Lose money for the firm and I will be understanding. Lose a shred of reputation for the firm and I will be ruthless. And having saved Solomon, he tried to cut back the excessive salaries and bonuses of its staff. Wall Street meets Warren. I can still remember a phone call I got from Warren one day after a compensation committee meeting where he had been unsuccessful in persuading the other members of the committee that our compensation package was too high. Uh, Warren made a point when he reached me on the phone of telling me that he'd been thinking about this all the way uptown on the subway. Uh, at the time, the Solomon Brothers management all had cars and drivers to take them uptown. They didn't ride the subway like Warren. Buffett never got much gratitude for saving the jobs of the bankers, especially when he tried to cut their bonuses. Some of the senior Solomon personnel grumbled a bit about his presence, and if I remember correctly, the people on the risk arbitrage desk even tried to get the firm to buy him out in order to get rid of him. 
Today, it seems the whole world is worried about bankers' bonuses. Buffett shares the concerns with the deeply held view that the super-rich aren't as smart as they think. Basically, most of the rich people in the United States, and probably the UK too, I mean, they, they would not have done quite as well if they'd been in Bangladesh or someplace like that. I mean, they may think they did it all by themselves, but the society has done an awfully lot for them. And, and if you get the chance to live very rich in the society, you really ought to, in my view, you ought to have a taxation system, but you also ought to have a personal value system where you believe that, that a lot of that ought to go back to the people that got the short straws in life. Buffett's experience at Solomon Brothers has never put him off Wall Street completely. And last year, he invested $5 billion in the Wall Street giant Goldman Sachs. He negotiated hugely favorable terms in the darkest days of the financial crisis. Everybody was scared. There were some of the largest companies in the United States that if the Federal Reserve hadn't stepped in, they wouldn't have met their payroll. I did not feel that we would be dumb enough, really, in a really basically prosperous country to let sort of the, uh, the misfunction of the financial engine bring down the country. But there was a time there where you wondered about that. True to his philosophy, Buffett ignored the markets and put money in when everyone else was getting theirs out. But investing in Wall Street, is that part of the Buffett philosophy? He's also been making some big bets using derivatives, complicated investment instruments that he once famously condemned as financial weapons of mass destruction. There's clearly more to Buffett than meets the eye. You look at Berkshire and you think of things like the furniture company or Dairy Queen. But when you look at where the massive profits and the cash generation is coming from, it's really from the insurance business. It's really from derivatives. It's really from the investments that he's making on Wall Street. And so there is a disconnect. There's a divide between what you see on one side, which looks very simple, and what's actually happening behind the curtain. Buffett now deals in such large sums that cozy family businesses are too small for his billions. He has to be resourceful. And it means there's another element in the Buffett formula, even if it's one he wouldn't admit to. Always be ready to break your own rules. Why are you dealing in derivatives? Because this is quite counter to the image we have of what you invest in. If we think some financial instrument is mispriced significantly and that I know enough to make that evaluation, uh, we'll buy it. Uh, so you do speculate, you see. This comes back to where we started. You will speculate. I, I, no, I, I would regard... It's not no, like your other businesses, is it? it must no, be. no, but it's, it's an analytical process of, of, of looking at the very, various economic factors that are going to affect a given instrument. Is that Benjamin Graham? Uh, no, he would understand you've, you've it. cheated, you've cheated, haven't you? I mean, you've, no, he would, there are just times when you see an opportunity no, and you can't resist. You can't resist punting. Well, yeah, but the opportunity is based on an analysis of, of, of fundamentals. There's one final and undisputed element to be added to any guide to Buffett's approach to money. What you do when you've made it is give it away. Three years ago, Buffett announced he was giving the bulk of his fortune to charity. $31 billion would go to the foundation run by Bill and Melinda Gates, where Gates' own fortune is being used to improve health and agriculture in the developing world. Uh, that was a complete surprise to me. And, you know, I said, wow. Uh, the first time he said it, I thought, well, that's at least been nice. You know, he's saying that it would be rational to do that. Uh, he's not really saying he's going to do it. But the second time I, he brought it up, I knew he was considering it seriously. Buffett had thought carefully about the decision. Some people are better at certain things than others. You know, there's a lot of people who can sing a lot better than I can. A lot of people can draw a lot better than I can. And there are people who can give away money better than I can. I'm better at making money than most people. And somebody else can be better at giving it away, so I'll, I'll have them do it. Almost nobody's crying. It's amazing. And unlike other great philanthropists, 
Buffett's generosity won't be remembered in the names of the organisations he's funding. Are you never tempted to have the name Buffett more prominently displayed? No. I mean, you don't even find streets or buildings no. or... Charities can get money by naming things for people, so why not... Why waste a building on me? <laughs> They're going to get my money anyway. For Gates, Buffett is not just another big donor. He's a role model. There's a philosophy of life of you know, embracing people, having fun at what you do, doing it with some humor, that you know, I'll always strive uh, to do those things uh, nearly as well as Warren does. Sure. Okay, thank you so much. Come on. Thank you so here, well, much. We'll do the Anna Nicole Smith shot here. Let me grab my billfold. Buffett will be 80 next year and is still firing on all cylinders. I was whispering to you the stock I'm buying. Okay, okay. You got it? Okay. But one day, Berkshire Hathaway will continue without him. It will be a memorial. But what else? What about how you'd like him to be remembered? I don't know, because I think of him as a father. You know? I do. It's really weird when you've got a famous parent <laughs> who's, you know, out there and everybody sees the person. I remember pulling out my credit cards in a store once and buying something and someone saw my name and they said, oh, are you related to Warren? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, you're so lucky. And I thought, what a funny thing to say. They don't know him. Now, yes, I am, but not for the reasons they think. I'm not lucky because I've got a rich, famous dad. You know, I'm lucky because I've got him. <laughs> Buffett says he enjoys himself so much that he tap dances to work every day. Okay, good. Come on in. Yeah. With the two of us. Okay. <laughs> we have had a lot of fun together, Warren and I, and if we've been a little more successful than other people, it's because we always realized that the school of life was always open. And if you weren't learning more, you were falling behind. And it just happened that the way we like spending our days coincided with something that worked in the investment process. So weren't we lucky people? If we'd like chorus girls, we wouldn't have such a good investment record. Warren Buffett has accumulated more wealth than almost anyone ever. Unfortunately for us, that was never as simple a task as he makes it seem. You can't easily copy it at home. But Buffett is still worth emulating. Because of all the billionaires in the world, he's uniquely clever, funny and generous. Warren Buffett really is different to the other super wealthy, the kind of people that you read about and perhaps even envy. I'm sorry that Mr. Buffett can't tell you how to make money like they do, but I suppose at least you can pick up some tips on how to lead a rich life like he does. Okay, guys, thanks. Have a good day. See you next time. Okay, thank you very much. He's good inspiration for The Apprentice USA. That's over on BBC One at 11.20. Have I Got News For You's next on BBC Two, and then later... Who backs Blair for president? Of the EU, that is. We'll be exploring the divide at the heart of Europe. And should you have to prove your faith before you can enrol in a faith school, the case has gone all the way to the new UK Supreme Court. And why swapping at Westminster? Join us at 10.30.